Here's a man that's the kill bit at parties. The guy who makes the whipped cream for the fail panel waffles, if you know what I mean, and is also secretly wants to enter oh, John's God. mom into oh, the security God. CTF at DEF CON. Uh, uh, Paul uh, Esadorian. Hello, everyone, and welcome oh, to this edition of Fallout That's Cal it, security everybody. Week. Show's over. Yeah. Uh, drop the mic. We're Re done. Thank Record you. time. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> I, I would, I would offer mom. Larry a high five, but he'd have, we'd have to put down our beer. <laughs> God. Quite possibly the most epic introduction of the show uh, thus yes. far, Larry. That was that was that was good. Uh, welcome everyone to this episode of Paul.com Security Weekly. This is episode three hundred and thirty nine. We're recording on July eighteenth, two thousand and thirteen. This will be our last show before Black Hat Defcon. B sides and DEF CON. After that, we will return on August eighth. There'll be a little bit of a hiatus. I hope to catch up with as many listeners as possible. You're here. John and I will be in um, some of the first ones to arrive at Black Hat for training. So make sure you check us out. I'll have a few more details after I announce the illustrious panel here at Paul.com. To my left, none other than Mr. Larry Pesce. Uh, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that intro. It, uh, no, just I loved it. it just came to me, like entering John's mom. <laughs> oh, oh my god remember sorry, sorry john that's the last one i promise parking no it's not i know it's not I no, just, it, it, it is it, it is now it now is. remember Her mom though. has mad hacking skills and you can't hang i am sorry i just just, I, just like know, my penis <laughs> there is parking in the rear allison oh, Nixon Jesus. Hi, is here with us welcome allison to the show allison was a little bit of a hiatus it's good to have you back in studio thank you good to see you here yeah. oh, what the hell? allison where were you I was just really busy with work. It's like one thing or another. I plan to come in, and then I have to go to Massachusetts. As, so, John, or, or, as John would say, if it's one thing or my mother. No, oh, oh, wow. Wow. Or, or, or Allison would, hey, is there a podcast tonight? I'm at Paul's house, and he's oh, not yeah. here. I'm like, no, it's canceled this week. <laughs> yeah, the one week I showed up, I'm standing outside your door, pissing your dogs off. And they're barking their heads off. I'm like, is anyone home? No, That's nobody's awesome. <laughs> Jack Daniels here with us tonight. Welcome, Jack. Where? To the show. What? Oh, hey! Jack, hey, we spent some quality time together this week. That was we fun. We did indeed. And that was we fun. drank some beer and... We went... <laughs> We witnessed the aftermath of someone stealing rims off an Escalade, which was yeah, awesome. that was what? that was awesome. That was the highlight they, of the whole trip. Yeah, somebody was inch blades. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They just about. They were huge, huge. Uh, huge. I only saw the car on cinder blocks so after I, someone had stolen the rims into and tires. The, I pulled into the parking lot, um, noticed one of the tires was flat. Uh, ran back out to to have dinner and well beer uh, with. Some friends and coworker and uh, well, beer is dinner. It's liquid bread. Mm -hmm. Came home and we came back to the hotel. <laughs> nothing odd. Got up in the morning, opened the curtains, looked out the window. You know, twenty feet from my window, and here's an Escalade on four cinder blocks. Where is this? In uh, uh, Ellicott City, Maryland. Maryland. Our usual hotel was full because of the fish concert or something. Uh. So <laughs> we ended up at we ended up at something that's a little farther away, but you know, one of those apartmenty kind of. I uh, like that, like yeah. a Homewood Suites or something. Yeah, like one that. of those kind of effort. Yeah, 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 but it was uh, it was nice. It was good, except for the. Uh, and then after that, I noticed there are not responsible for whatever you know the parking lot standard disclaimer oh. signs, but they're everywhere. <laughs> Yeah. All around the parking lot. It's like, oh, wow, good. Interesting. If anybody steals my tires, I hope they fix my brakes while they're in there, because I had, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> John Strand is here with us on the lines via Skype from South Dakota. Welcome, John. Hello, everybody. And from sunny Puerto Rico, we bring you Carlos Perez. Welcome, Carlos. Or not. Hey, Paul. Hey, hey, hey Carlos. He, How's must been, he must have been on mute. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Just a couple of quick announcements to get us started before we jump into our feature interview for the show. Uh, as I said, John and I will be at Black Hat in Las Vegas July 27th through the 30th, offering two classes, two different instances of offensive countermeasures. You can also buy our book, which there's a link in the show notes to buy it. It's only 10 bucks. Is the paperback version the same price, John? No, the paperback version is going to be 20 because it's actually it's a physical actually dead and, and you can yeah. touch it. However, however, two things about that. One, if you register for our class at Black Hat, you will get the first, literally the first 40 editions, 50 editions, how many students we have of the book. Number John, one. Are we going to sign all? We should sign yes, every we will, single one. We will one sign all yeah. 40 of them. 
And then the other thing is uh, we're also going to be selling signed copies of the book, I believe, at the Tenable booth at, yes. at Black Hat. Yes. So we'll have them there as well. So if you want to get like the first hot off the presses edition of Offensive Countermeasures, The Art of Active Defense, check it out. And if anybody's I, concerned, these are these were uh, organic, free-range trees that were that's right. humanely slaughtered for this book. Well, uh, and we'll, we'll have them. At, so we will have a table at DefCon. We will have brand new hack naked shirts, which are white shirts with black lettering, um, men's sizes, and we will have ladies uh, tank tops, rib uh, white tank tops with a pink logo nice. on the front. We will have hack. Hopefully, have hack naked stickers if they get here in time. The shirts arrive yet? Uh, the shirts are have men's shirts have already been printed and are oh, on their nice. way already to being shipped. The lady shirts are being uh, printed here with the laser printer. So the lady shirts will actually be right. laser printed uh, rib tank tops. Huh. They won't be screen printed, which I thought I'd try. That's interesting. Pleasure ridges? What? Yeah. yeah. Yes, ribbed for her pleasure. Uh, <laughs> and then we will have copies of the offensive countermeasures, the art of active defense, for sale at our DefCon table as well That's for nice. ten dollars. Excellent. Is that right, John? Did I get all that right? That sounds about right. Absolutely. And, and wait, Romer knows we're coming this year, right? Uh, so it's transitioned <laughs> to a di- yeah, it's transitioned to a different person that's running, mm. and it's uh, I, I think his name's Mike. And yeah, I've already sent the check. <laughs> well, and they have a larger vendor area this year, so we don't oh, have sweet. The, uh, a little larger vendor area at oh, DefCon nice. this year. Nice. Uh, I think I think I need to buy, so, some, uh, buy some more stuff from Simple Wi-Fi for the, uh, yeah, the zombie defense. Mike vehicle. Perez. And expert Steve will be working the booth at DEF CON this year. Nice. So you can go say hi to them. And that's everything that will be happening at uh, DEF CON and Black Hat, well, as far actually, as Polycom goes. And I Allison will be speaking at Black, Hat. at Black Hat. Jack is running B-Size Las Vegas. Yes, I'm yep. speaking and speaking. I'm speaking on bitters, classic cocktails, bar culture, a very non, well, non-infosec, I won't say non-technical talk. Also, I'm doing a. I uh, might argue also breach. Also, we yeah, well, I mean, it's you're driven to drink in this industry, so and, you know, I mean, it's it's not like driving us to drink requires packing up the RV. But um, I'm also on a um, just because I can't get away from it. Breach disclosure, not not bone disclosure. We we can't have that conversation ever again. But breach disclosure. Um, so I do also want to say that oh, Steve is going and, out there oh. not just to work the booth, but he will be filming a, a documentary film. So I'm going to put him on the hook for that officially. So there will be a documentary film that will chronicle his travels in the drive cross country with Jack Daniel. Uh, I hear Black banjos. Hat, yeah, <laughs> Black Hat, B sides, and DefCon. So it'll be a short documentary, short film that I, Steve will be. I, I think uh, producing. that's a mockumentary. It's a more mockumentary. Than documentary. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So and uh, Jack and I are also on the fail panel. Yes. Well, I'm not. In I'm. I'm. I'm I'll, You're I'll, an athletic supporter. I'm an athletic supporter. Okay. I'm sure I'll be doing the. Food and whatever run. Fake. Yeah. I'll be doing the Walmart run. Nice. And, if you uh, haven't done a Walmart run with Alex Sutton and, and uh, Beaker and Beaker, well, in oh. Vegas, <laughs> just yep. so I'll leave that to your imagination. I, I am on the, the, You're fail, on the fail panel, panel this year. Con. I am speaking at the Wireless Village. Yeah. So check out the Wireless Village. At and Defcon's good plug. I am a volunteer examiner for the ham radio exam on Sunday. Nice. So uh, many, of, almost all of us will be involved with Black Hat DefCon or B sides in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Yes. And come to my Tenable party on Wednesday, seven thirty at Rum Bar. Either come see me or come to the Tenable booth to get your ticket. And or come give us invites to other parties. Yes, please do. <laughs> come wander over and hand Paul a or coin for Microsoft's party on Thursday night, since I won't. <laughs> no, wait. <that's laughs> I will be. I'm leaving Thursday. I know. That's so, why yeah. I said hand you the coin. Yes, and I give it to you. Gotcha. <laughs> Never mind. Um, we've got webcast coming up. There is one on Wednesday, July 24th with Anapsis at 2 p.m. There's a link in the show notes for that registration. Moo. Also coming up, and we're going to talk about SAP and cows. Uh, unicorns. And unicorns. Cows and unicorns. Moo. So August 22nd, there's a webcast with Symantec titled Fighting Mauer, Taking Back the Endpoint. Which we can relate to some farm animal if you like. You know what? Put on Twitter what farm animal you want us to use in that webcast, and we'll we'll relate it somehow. How's that for a challenge? Um, and we're always looking for sponsors um, for upcoming webcasts. Contact Mike at HackNaked.tv for details. Uh, for other sponsorship opportunities, you can contact Paul at HackNaked.tv. Check out the Stogie Geek Show, which has been postponed this week. We will be either doing it on Monday or Tuesday night of next week, and that again will be our last show before we break. We're going to come back on August 8th, though, and we've got an aggressive schedule and we've got all kinds of fun surprises for you. 
Very coming nice. up. I also do want to say that this episode is sponsored by the great cause, FreeJohnStransMom.com. <laughs> you can visit FreeJohnStransMom.com for more information on how you can benefit that great cause. And here comes the Java payload right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, Shit, I need to register that domain before it gets too far down. Yeah. Uh, co- co-executive producer Rob Kornmeyer just registered that domain. John, I was going to so say, yeah. dude, that's my <laughs> fucking job. <laughs> yes. We beat you all to it. I'm like, dude, you're going to register that. At the end of announcements, I'm going to announce it, so you better register it. I did. Uh, FreeJohnStransMom.com. Which, by the way, you said if the, uh, there was an internal discussion going along. Uh, if you have any interesting domains that you wanted to transfer, I yeah. will pop up the list during the podcast and let you take a yeah, look. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, please do. I want to go oh shopping. You, you may not have spearfishing for poopsharks.com. I'm uh, sorry. Hey, okay. hey, hey, and uh, is this going to become like Garbage Pail Kids? Like we start trading domains with each other? Mm. We could. That would be trade. pretty awesome. I some to trade, too. Alrighty, on to our feet. Sorry yeah, for that no long way. introduction. What, we have a podcast yeah, to do now? Yeah. Is that, good night, everyone. A, Thanks for listening. It's a good thing we haven't had somebody patiently waiting for... Oh. Yes. Um, On the other side of the planet, no less. Everyone say good morning to Troy Hunt, a software architect and Microsoft MVP... You usually find him writing about security concepts and process improvement in software delivery on his blog. He also has a free ebook out, OWASP Top 10 for .NET Developers. Welcome, Troy, to the show. G'day, guys. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. And you're in the future. Troy's in uh, Australia, correct? I'm in the future, and it's, it's looking bright down here, guys. The That's future good. is really, really nice. It's nice to know we don't have to worry about an apocalypse tomorrow or anything like that. Uh, so, Troy, how did you get your start as, uh, did you start out as a developer or in security? I want to hear kind of how you got started in this career. Yeah, I started out uh, as a developer. You know, I started out in sort of the early days of the web, kind of uh, early to mid-90s, which was a, a pretty good time. And the, you know, the security side has probably come in more recently in the last maybe five or six years. And it's, frankly, I just like breaking stuff, <laughs> you know, I like getting in there and pulling things apart and seeing how they work. And that's kind of led me in part from uh, from development to security. It, you know, that and the fact that a lot of the time these two don't get along real well, you know, this development um, discipline and security discipline. So I wanted to kind of uh, fill a little bit of a gap in the middle there. Very cool. So <clears throat> what advice do you have those getting started in software security, right? That's your area of expertise, correct? Yeah, yeah. So software security, in particular web security. And I, look, I mean, I think the the main advice is, I, I guess it depends what angle you're coming from, you know, you're coming from the development side, you're coming from the security side. But I think that the, the big need that I see is just bridging the two, you know. So I think the best advice I can give is if you can play a role that sort of sits between those two guys, um, helps everyone get along a little bit better. But, you know, there's a, there's a need for that because there's just too much friction uh, that I've been seeing in the past. So, yeah, that's where I'd be focusing, I think. You know, that, that ties very nicely into one of my other questions that I had is, what can we as security professionals do to relate to developers? Look, I, I think part of it is, is just acknowledging everyone's on the same team to begin with. And I, I've just seen a lot of cases in the past where it's kind of like, you know, security guys, you might all be in the same company, sort of the same objectives. They'll, they'll go, look, this is broken, this is broken, this is broken. So throw it over the fence, go and fix it. And I think that probably the two things that stand out to me with that is, um, you know, number one, you've, you've got to be a little bit more constructive insofar as uh, explaining why it is broken. You know, what what is the problem? What might this lead to? For developers, I, I think we're very um, we're very sort of uh, mechanically minded, you know, we want to know how things work. So, you know, I'll give you an example of the, the security uh, scan might come back and they go, okay, look, you've got uh, CSRF vulnerabilities all over the place, go and fix it. And the developers go and CS, what? <laughs> you know, what, what is this thing? So I think being able to explain, okay, well, this is, this is what an attack might look like. This is what the exploit is. This is why it's important to fix it. And the other thing is, this is how to do it. Uh, you know, a lot of the time, it's it's like, look, this is broken, go and fix it. And the developer's going, well, all right, well, um, yeah, what do I do now? So, you know, that that's one. And, and the other thing is, uh, I guess, acknowledgement from, from both sides that at the end of the day, the objective here is to get working software out, right? Working software that hopefully is going to sort of be as secure as possible and not bring the organisation down. But th- that's the objective. We've got to work together to get something out there that's working 
And usually there's business demands that want to get this stuff out as soon as possible as well. So uh, I, I guess that's just a little bit of uh, all playing on the same team, you know? Mm. Um, so do you have uh, kind of advice for the other side for uh, developers as to how they can be more security-minded? Yeah, and look, I, I think the, the thing I'm focusing on with developers at the moment is you, you've got to know how to break your own stuff, right? Mm. So if, if you want to be more security-minded and... I mean, resources like OWASP are, are a good good place to start. You know, start with the top 10. How do I exploit each one of these top 10 risks? If a developer can start to wrap their head around why insecure transport layers are at risk, you know, what are the possible attack vectors to that, uh, you know, or, or why the, the, the hashing algorithms we use for our credentials are important, I think they need to get their head around that and I think they need to know how to exploit it. And, you know, even if they start with basic stuff, like how would I perform an XSS attack on my own app? You know, that's something pretty simple. And, uh, look, a lot of the time developers, again, we're kind of mechanical. We like pulling stuff apart, breaking things. I think that's something that appeals to them and that's a really great way to start to understand where the other side is coming from. Do you think that, um, uh, what's the level of interest, do you think, in developers in learning how to exploit the security weaknesses in their own software? I find, at least in my experience, and we can better qualify this, that it's a pretty low percentage that are really interested in breaking it. So it's a matter of tweaking the message to kind of make them a little more interested in it? Yeah, look, I agree. I think it is a bit of a low percentage, but look, I often relate security to developers in the same way as you might relate say performance it's look these are these are attributes that need to be an important part of what you build and they're, they're sort of disciplines all within themselves but it may not be that the developer takes a particular interest uh, in either of them so certainly they're, they're really essential attributes though and i think what we've got to do is just help developers understand it a little bit more and, and then to, to be honest most of the time when i when i show them uh you know how you might exploit an app they do tend to get a little bit excited because again they mm. you know they like constructing things even if it's a bit a bit deconstructive at times right um yeah once they can experience that the the the, the sort of the mindset shifts, they become a bit more engaged and they become a bit interested. Either that or you wait until they get pwned and then suddenly they're really, really interested and they really want to learn that. <laughs> right, right. You know, that works too, right? Uh, so do you have training or um, exercises that you recommend for developers to experiment with uh, exploitation technologies? Yeah, look, I mean, there's a lot of resources out there. I mean, there's a plug my own stuff. Obviously, there's the ebook you mentioned before, so that'll, you know, you can go and pick that up for free now from troyant.com, and that'll tell you, you know, demonstrate for each one of these top 10 risks um, within the ASP.NET framework, how do I go through and break it? Yeah, no, it's uh, interesting. It's all- uh, a friend of mine is a .NET developer and recommended that we have you on the show. So, obviously, uh, awesome. you've got some good reach, and he uh, is familiar with your work. Thanks, mate. <laughs> so there's there's that. Uh, I've also got an online uh, course. So there's a, a training company called Plural Site that's uh, very popular with developers. So there's about eight hours of training there that takes developers through the whole thing in a very sort of structured, formal fashion. And, and uh, you know, I think that's a great resource as well. Uh, beyond that, you know, maybe using even some of the vulnerable um, uh, demo apps out there. I think uh, I think it's WebGoat, isn't it? That I, I was has got or a, yep. a few of these yep. sort of style uh, web apps. It's like, hey, here's something that is designed for you guys guys to go and break it's got known vulnerabilities and no one's going to lock you up if you do break it you know go and play with that and there's a lot of resources out there for that and i guess the other thing as well is that you know certainly on the web stack you've got to try and relate it back to your framework technology right so you know you should be able to go and i guess experience the same kind of attack vectors say for SQL injection, whether it's a PHP app or whether it's an ASP.NET app, but you're then going to need to take that back and figure out how do I properly implement mitigations in my framework because they're going to be different in each. Um, so you recently wrote an article that talked about developers hacking themselves and you mentioned it already. Um, so do you think that developers should try and break their own code? Should QA be a part of that process? Should security be still continue part of that process? Should it be all of the above? Like, what do you rep- recommend as the workflow for breaking what you're building? 
Well, look, I, I guess the workflow, thinking chronologically, while well, stuff is being built, I, I think you've got to be able to try and break it. And that's why I'm focusing a lot more on uh, on this hack yourself first concept. And um, uh, props to Jeremiah Grossman for coining that phrase too. I have stolen it from him. <laughs> so thank you. Um, but look, it, it does have to be the developers first insofar as if, if you guys are going to implement a feature before you go to QA, certainly before you go further down the wire and you might end up having scans and that sort of thing done, you know, try and break it yourself. Look at your input sanitization and your, you know, your various attack vectors. Understand how to do that yourself. So that's where I think it's got to start. Mm. And, you know, the other thing with that is that we've all seen these figures before about the cost of remediation of software, how it exponentially increases as you go further through the life cycle, right? So if we can fix something in the design phase, it's going to cost a fraction of development, which is a fraction of test, which is a fraction of when we're already live and we've got to go and pull the thing apart again. So there's a real good uh, return on investment argument to be made for hacking yourself during the development process. Absolutely. Uh, what, what's the most often misunderstood um, with respect to input sanitization. So you had some articles about input sanitization on, yeah. on the blog. It's one of those things where we talked about it last week. Every top 10 list that you see, or top 5 list that says, hey, write more secure code, right? The number one thing or number two thing on everyone's list is, well, good input sanitization. Um, mm. But what, what, where does. So obviously, if we're making those recommendations still, we still haven't got it right. Yeah, look, I think probably the most misunderstood thing that I see is is blacklists. You know, people write a blacklist and they go, okay, so long as we keep the angle brackets out, it's all okay, right? right <laughs> and it's, right, right. Uh, it's not, okay, well, we'll keep the single quotes out as well. Yeah, well, that's not quite going to be enough either. So, yeah, I, I think moving this mentality from uh, being very myopic around single inputs and single usage contexts and single attack vectors for that. So, you know, I'm going to protect against XSS for this one particular piece of input. And then later on, you go and use it as unparameterized SQL or something like that. And, you know, hey, you got a problem. So, uh, you know, conversely, then how do we get people thinking about what valid whitelist might be? Um, and, you know, a lot of the time it's, it's easy when you're going to typecast something and look, if it's not a date format, it's not going to work anyway. But trying to get the, the thinking around, all right, well, how might I whitelist something like a, a name or an address? Uh, and then, of course, it opens up the whole discussion about, all right, what's the usability impact? And, you know, we're going to make life hard on people and suddenly Irish people can't register because they can't use quotes, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. Right, right. Um, so are there libraries that really, really help people with input sanitization? I almost feel it's like the encryption problem, right, where... People that try and write their own crypto algorithms fail, like, 99.99% of the time. And I feel it's the same way with input sanitization. People that try and code it themselves usually miss some things or not implementing it correctly. Are there libraries, specifically in your areas, right, ASP.NET primarily, it, uh, which libraries should people be really, like, not live without kind of thing? Yeah, look, I mean, I guess the, the first thing is, is again, where there's libraries, you know, come on, you, use them, you know, don't write this stuff yourself. I think crypto is probably the utopian example there. Mm. In terms of input sanitization, at, at least in the context of web apps where we're mostly dealing with, say, you know, form registration data or, or you know, very frequently just string values, it, it's tricky. I mean, it's a real case-by-case sort of thing. So, you know, look, if, if you want to perform input sanitization on a, you know, a, an email address or something, okay, there's regexes for that. If, if you want to um, then go through and sort of format fragments for safe HTML usage, well, we've got libraries like anti-XSS, um, which is in, in uh, partly baked into the framework now and partly available by a third-party package. So there's bits and pieces that get you there, but I, I think it's a hard problem, and I think it's a hard problem because it it does have this big degree of business logic in it, which is going to change from case to case. You know, I don't know that we can sort of go, look, here's the one true sanitization library for when someone wants to register with an address, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a physical address. That's just going to be a hard problem. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I didn't know that's an interesting perspective. I never really thought about relating it so closely to your application and why that's, um, why that's a problem. I just always thought, well, we could just come up with a library, right, and everyone would be fine. <laughs> Not so much. Just turn it on. Yeah, <laughs> It'll yeah, be fine. Just click on. Like, make my app secure button, right? 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a utopian dream of mine. Um, so do we? So would we talked a little bit about training, but so how do you train your developers to write secure code? Um, did we? I guess we kind of covered that already. Um, did we talked about different training programs. Is there anything more on the training developers? I feel like there are programs available, but obviously we have applications that are still severely broken, mm. so they either yeah, not yeah, doing yeah. training effectively and, or... You know, I've written a, a couple of things lately and then done a couple of talks about where you look at some of the, the understandings developers have. I've got this one talk where it's there's this question on Stack Overflow and the, the question says, um, you know, I want to store credentials. How do I do it securely? Which is, all right, it's a reasonable question. <laughs> and there's about three answers in a row where the first guy goes, well, you just... Basically, you base 64 encode it and put it in the database. <laughs> and then the next guy goes, uh, well, you, you just do character rotation. So, you know, rotate about five characters. And then the next guy goes, no, you rotate about seven characters. <laughs> and there's just this, you know, the, it's just a, amazing. You know, we do see so many attacks and so many breaches. And, you know, it, it kind of looks really sophisticated and scary in the news. But, oh, man, <laughs> I mean, this is low-hanging fruit, did it, right? Did anyone say they were going to XR it twice? <laughs> yeah, rock answer. 13 times 2 because right. it's twice yeah. as good. Um, oh, hell yeah. So, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what it comes down to, there's got to be a, a, a dedicated security component to training. You know, we, we, we have all this training and education around how to build web applications, and you just get so much stuff in there. And one of the things I like about resources like Pluralsight is that you can go in now and you get very deep training on very discrete topics. If you just want to know uh, how to use Microsoft's ORM technology, bang, there's about five different courses that go into it in massive detail. And I think for, for teams, you've almost got to go through and say, yeah, along with security, what are the sort of things that are really critical for our developers to know? And, and being entirely objective, it's going to be things like how do we properly use you know, jQuery and single page app type models and all that sort of thing. But you almost need to have a bit of a program where you say, this is all the stuff that our developers have got to know. Here's discrete focused professional training on each one of those topics. You know, put it in their KPIs or in their objectives or something like that, but have them go through and do specific training on the topic. Mm. No, that's a good point. Um, what can we learn from Microsoft's model of software security? We know we've touched upon it briefly on a lot of past shows, but I mean, what are the real takeaways if you had to look at how Microsoft really, in my opinion, and I think several others have made a really good um, progression in secure? I'd say they turn it around. I, I really would. Um, what, what can we learn from that practically? Well, I think there's two angles to it. There's, there's sort of the, um, the communication, the openness side, and then there's the implementations that they've got in their frameworks. And you know, on the first point, I, I get a sense, and, and to be honest, as, as an MVP, there's not a whole lot more that I see that, that the general public doesn't. But, you know, I'm just seeing a sense of communication now where they're more open to, to feedback. You know, they've got a bug bounty program now. They've got, you know, good resources online for, um, for collecting uh, you know, vulnerabilities or or um, other feedback that people might have. So there, there does seem to be a, a bit of a mind shift. And I think, to be honest, it's consistent with generally being a more open Microsoft than what it was a decade ago, where the, this behemoth was very closed and did everything, you know, with their own stuff. You know, now they're, they're opening up a lot more. They're taking a lot more from the community, whether that be in terms of features they build into the, um, build into the products or or feedback from security-minded people. So I, I think the openness <clears throat> is good, and that's very consistent with other organisations as well. I think also the, the things that they're building into the framework now are a lot better. And the, the funny thing is, at the end of the day, this is still all HTTP and web browsers. I mean, we've had this for, you know, going on 20 years now, right? But the, the defences that they're building into the framework, so particularly when we build a new application in something like ASP.NET's MVC implementation, the, the default output encoding everywhere, the CSRF protection everywhere with anti-forgery tokens, the hashing algorithms are getting increasingly stronger. There seems to be a consistent shift of uh, towards secure by default. And as much as I'd like developers to understand why it's secure and what's actually happening, the fact that you can take a new project out of the box now and have so many of those things more secure than what they were even three years ago, yeah, I think that's a very good result. Um, so what are some of the most easy software features to secure? 
Like, are there, I kind of want to, you know, talk about what some things are kind of easy wins for developers, and then what things, like, are really difficult and take a lot more time and planning. Look, I think the easy stuff uh, are things where there are an increasing array of native defenses. So, you know, I, I just mentioned things like ASP.NET MVC and, and output encoding. So, uh, honestly, cross-site scripting is getting a lot easier to defend against when as soon as you emit uh, output from uh, the system, it's automatically HTML output encoded. You, you know, like this is becoming an easy problem to solve now. And in fact, you've really got to almost deliberately shoot yourself in the foot a lot of the time to, to screw that up. But, you know, some people manage to. Uh, so, you know, obviously on the XSS front, I think the other thing that's getting really easy to secure now is, is SQL injection. And one of the reasons for that is that these ORMs, the, you know, the object relational mappers, object persistence between the data layer and the app tier, are being automated and using things like Entity Framework in, in .NET makes it really, really hard to, to screw up and end up with SQL I flaws you know i mean this is a good thing and it's more of that sort of secure by default um you know conversely other things are still hard i, I think it's still hard to get crypto right you know a lot of the algorithms that are that are built in for hashing is still um pretty weak by modern standards we still don't really have good mechanisms for key management for um, um asymmetrical symmetric encryption so yeah and i think know, people people don't put as much effort i think as they should into that whole process of storing credentials you know, I think they kind of define in their yeah. own what, what might be good enough and then anything that's really in order of magnitude more work, which would increase security by quite a bit, is kind of left by the wayside. I, I agree with that. But yeah, yeah and, you know, I don't even think it's more work anymore because if, if you go and grab a brand new ASP.NET MVC project, you know, in, in a current version of Visual Studio, you'll get a, a thousand rounds of um, SHA-1 and PBKDF2 and all the other nuts and bolts and things that go into it and, you know, strong salts. You know, it's, it's all in there. All you do is file a new project and you're done. But, you know, you mentioned before people rolling their own rather than using frameworks, and that's still happening a lot. So there's that. And I guess the other thing is it's, it's a little bit confusing because if developers just look at the surface of it and they go, okay, I know that passwords are meant to be stored as hashes, right, so we'll hash it. Yeah, but did you solve it? Oh, no, I didn't know about that. Okay, I've got to do that. Okay, and then how many rounds? Oh, yeah, I didn't know about that. So, you know, it, it, it is a bit of a um, – it, it's not a hard concept, but there are multiple facets to it, and it's very easy to just focus on one facet and miss the rest of it. Right. Uh, Troy, are you planning on attending uh, any conferences coming up here? Not in the U.S. I've got a, a few down here in Australia, including uh, TechEd uh, down here in um, on the Gold Coast in a couple of months. But uh, unfortunately, you guys are a hell of a long way away over there. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. Yeah, I've, been, I've done I've done the uh, obverse and come to teach a SANS course in Sydney. And it's a hell of a long trip. Uh, it, it is, and you know that flight just sort of destroys you for a day as well. It's it, it's a shocker. I did come over to Seattle earlier this year, and I, I was almost a writer for the week because I just you know I'm six foot five as well. So you fold me in an oh. airplane sleep, and I'm just not going to sleep. It's a ride. Mm. Yeah. Did anyone else have any questions for Troy? Sorry, I meant to ask that earlier. John Carlos, I'm good. Already, Troy. Uh, if we come out to uh, Australia, we will look you up. We've been known, as Larry uh, uh, mentioned. Now, now, now the question is, what part of Australia? Right. So mostly I am in Sydney, and I also spend a lot of time on the Gold Coast, uh, where I'm from as well. So it's it's all East Coast. It's all this tiny, tiny little bit on the right-hand side of, a, of an otherwise um, very bloody big place. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. And that's why I asked, because... Yeah, people say Australia, and they think it's a it's a small place you can drive across in a day, and yeah, not so much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, not so much. <laughs> yeah, no, no, not so much. And, and even if you could, you probably don't want to, especially not get stuck getting stuck in the middle. Yeah, well, this is the thing, right? There's nothing in the middle. It's like there's these little bits around the edges, and then we've got a big rock in the middle, and everything else is just desert. That's it. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so, Troy, are you ready to play five questions on Paul.com? Yeah, let's go for it. Already, three words to describe yourself. Uh, fast, um, I'm stubborn, uh, yeah, and I'm tall. <laughs> if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? 
Yeah, well, you don't want to get too messy. So probably uh, something remote, something long range. I, I think to put a little bit of a, an AppSec spin on it, maybe um, hacking pacemakers to electrocute people or nice. increase heart rates. Or nice. you, know, you want to go out with a little bit of, wow, that was kind of cool. Now, I hear this game is growing in popularity in Australia. In the game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? I think I'd probably have to go second. I want to see where the bar is going to be set on the yeah. level of Ask Grabby. Yeah, yeah right. now, now, Paul, some might argue that the game of Ask Grabby Grabby originated in Australia. It's right. It's, so. it's a timeless game. <laughs> if you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? I'm going to channel Ricky Bobby and, and go with I Want to Go Fast. Stranded on a desert island or in the middle of Australia, which tablet would you bring with you if you could choose only one? Android, iPad, or Surface? I'm going to sound like the fanboy and go with Surface simply because if I can only take one thing, I need something that kind of does a bit of everything. Mm -hmm. I'd really like two so I could take my iPad and I could take a proper laptop. But if I've got to go in the middle, I'll take the Surface. And this, uh, this desert island has Wi-Fi, which is awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Really Man, well. I think he's the only person that's ever said a Surface. It could be. I, <laughs> someone answered that question earlier and said Surface because they could run virtual machines on it. Oh. Can you do that on a Surface? Yeah, yeah Surface yeah, Pro. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you'd want to try to virtualize on an RT. <laughs> it, would, it, would each, it has Wi Fi, but no power, so I don't, you oh, have yeah. to build your own power source to power oh, multiple right, virtual right. machines on your Surface. In any case, Troy Hunt, thank you very much for appearing on Paul.com. Thanks, guys. Been fun. Have a good have a good day, actually. Oh, good night. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. Enjoy the Thanks. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and bring on our next interview slash, I believe, tech segment for this show.